it's not causing a problem. So it's all part of your, uh, your quality process, or it can be part of your quality process. We design a lot of features in ProTop specifically with developers in mind um, because we're trying to help people to prevent problems rather than capture them after the fact. Uh, and you can even, uh, if you're clever, you can use uh, ProTop to defend yourself from those heartless DBAs that are you know, cruelly accusing you of doing vile things in your code. You can come back and say, no, that wasn't me. Um, that was Paul who did that, um, for instance. Um, so, moving on. Uh, that's a, a particular feature that we've created to help programmers get more value out of ProTop. Uh, then we have a, a little bit of finding the problem. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about the client statement cache and how that works and how it compares to ProGetStack. Uh, we'll talk about table and index activity and how you can use ProTop to get a, an overview of where the tables and indexes uh, in your system are being used, which ones are the most active, and whether or not that matches your expectations. As a developer, hopefully you've got some expectations about which tables and which indexes should be the most active, but you might be very surprised uh, to find out at runtime that things are not necessarily going the way you expect them to go. Um, we can do that both globally uh, and on a per user or per connection basis. Uh, active transactions and block sessions, a lot of times people have record locking problems or they have uh, issues with transactions whose scope is, is larger than they expect it to be. So we have a lot of features in there to help you with that as well. Um, figuring out who is, um, or how much time something really took. This is the progress profiler, the code profiler feature. Um, ProTop cannot profile a different session, uh, but we do have some tools that help you embed the profiler into your application so that you can make it easier for end users to help you out if they do have a problem. Uh, and how much time did something really take? Uh, oh, whoops, that is the profiler. <laughs> uh, what's going on with temp tables? So your modern applications, your modern progress applications are using a lot of pro data sets and a lot of temp tables. Uh, but as a programmer, you have very little insight into what's going on with temp table usage within your application. So once again, we've got some sample code that you can embed in your application that can help you figure that out. And then finally, uh, user table statistics. This is user level stats on table and index usage within a session. So let's get uh, right to it here. Um, we'll talk about, first we'll talk about programmer mode. So programmer mode uh, basically is, it changes ProTop's default. By default, when ProTop starts, it's automatically sampling the data every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, it gets a new, new sample, uh, and it calculates many of the metrics that you see on the screens as per second rate metrics. Uh, that's great as a DBA when you're wanting samples that you can compare from point to point to point to see whether the rates are still the same as they are. But as a programmer, you probably want to know more, more precisely how much activity a certain action that you take in your development or your QA environment is having against the database. So you don't want to have those rate numbers and you don't care so much about the sample length. So programmer mode uh, changes it from auto and rate uh, to, um, <coughs> to the uh, sample time uh, not being automatic, you have to hit a spacebar. And then uh, instead of rates, you get the raw numbers. Uh, so instead of seeing uh, one, two, three, four, five record reads per second, you see nine, eight, seven, six records read in whatever your sample period was. You can enable it with control P. And when you do that, <clears throat> the screen changes a little bit and auto changes to on demand and the rate changes to summary and the words programmer mode appear in the top left. So you know that you're in programmer mode. And from that point forward, you only sample when you hit the space bar. So you open another window, um, set up your test example, um, get, it, get it ready to go in your window, go back to ProTop, hit the space bar to initialize all the counters, zero them out, run your test code, go back to ProTop, hit the space bar again, and now you see what impact that bit of code had um, as far as the database is concerned. This is very, very helpful for confirming 
that the tables and the indexes and the activity that you're expecting to see with that particular piece of code is actually what's happening. And a lot of times you'll be very surprised. You'll see that different indexes got used at runtime than you expected to. Uh, you may see that uh, tables you weren't expecting to uh, have activity, had activity. Uh, especially this happens a lot of times with the meta schema tables. If you have uh, monitoring of the meta schema, schema tables enabled, you may see a lot of file and field references and things like that. That might be associated with dynamic queries, uh, compile on the fly sorts of things, all kinds of things that you might want to know about as a developer rather than be surprised about when you get to production. Um, so that's, whoops, I think I went too far there. Uh, another thing you can do when you're in programmer mode is you can look at the session specific statistics. Uh, so you use the um, capital U key uh, for that and that allows you to select a user number uh, which might be one of the user numbers that you pick up uh, from the UIO screen. Uh, you put it in there as number uh, 236 in this example. And then you can, if you choose, enable the client statement caching. Client statement caching, we'll talk about in more detail in a moment, but what that does is it gives you the line number and the program name that is being executed. And you have two options. You can say, just give me the top of the stack. Uh, that's option number one. Or you can say, give me the full stack. That's option number two. Uh, most of the time, option number one is really all you need. Uh, and it takes up uh, less space in the client server protocol and that kind of thing. Um, but sometimes you want the full stack and you can, you can get that uh, there as well. So you do that and now you get the table activity and the index activity, but this is no longer global. This is specific to your session. So you, if you're on a shared test server, um, this is better because you know, you're, you're not getting everybody else's stuff mixed in there. You're just getting your session and you can see uh, the reads that you did the index reads that you did, uh, and uh, the, the stack is down there, and can tell you what the flow of your program was uh, through that test scenario that you just did. So far, so good? All right. When you're all done, and you quit Protop, if you had the client statement cache enabled, Protop will give you a reminder and say, hey, do you want to disable that? Uh, so you don't accidentally leave it turned on. Uh, after you're done, which is a good thing. Um, Did you ever experience a troubleshoot with the client statement cache? Uh, so, so the question is, have we ever had problems with the client statement cache? Not since uh, the very er early releases. Uh, very early on, there were some bugs, uh, and you didn't want to necessarily leave it enabled for long periods of time. Uh, or globally and enable it in a production environment. Uh, but since, I would say, 11.4 thereabouts, it's been very, very stable. Uh, and we, we do have uh, customers who like it a lot and who basically just enable it globally and leave it, leave it running. Uh, and they're very successful with that. We haven't had any, anybody have a problem with it uh, for some time. Uh, it does, if you are in a client, we're, we're getting a little ahead of things, but if you are in a client server uh, environment, there is an impact uh, because that data has to go through with the TCP IP packages, and so you might want to take that in mind. The people that I'm aware of who run it full time are shared memory uh, users. Uh, so, programmer mode. Uh, if you were in yesterday's talk, you heard me talk a little bit about uh, our new web help. So we have a whole bunch of help here on the uh, help.wss.com that will go through all this in, in more detail. Uh, so if you don't remember what I had to say here, you can go to the web page and, and look that up and it'll give you a lot of great advice about running programmer mode and, and what you can get out of that. Okay, so the next feature, which we just sort of talked about a little bit, is the client statement cache. Um, the client statement cache helps you to figure out where your problems really are. So, you know, knowing that you have an unexpected problem, that you've seen that there's more table or more index activity or things are, are behaving differently than you expected is great. That's the first step in solving the problem. But it's even better 
if you know what program is causing the problem, and even better yet, what line number of what program. And this is where the client statement cache is a huge help to programmers, um, because this really gives you insight into what's driving that activity. And you can zero right in on it instead of having to search through your entire code base looking for references to order lines. That's just not very helpful, but knowing that it's a certain particular uh, line number in a certain program is way more helpful. So there are really two ways to get the uh, stack trace for a running session. Uh, the client statement cache is one, and pro get stack is another. Pro get stack is a command line utility that you can run, uh, and you can get a stack trace from any running progress session. Uh, there are some pros and cons. The client statement cache gives you the database line number of the last reference to the database. So it can only ever tell you what's going on with the database. Uh, whereas ProGetStack is not restricted to the database and it will tell you the 4GL line number that's running. In a lot of ways, that's a big advantage. Um, however, uh, ProGetStack requires you to run it on the, whatever machine the client is running on. So if you, were, if you don't have access to all the client machines or you don't necessarily know which client a, somebody's connecting from, uh, you can't run a uh, pro get stack. Whereas the client statement cache, you can run from the database server and you don't need any special privileges. You don't need to be uh, anything more than a DBA. So you don't need to have root privileges or sysadmin privileges or, or that kind of thing. So that's a big, big advantage. Uh, client statement cache is forward looking. So if you haven't enabled it, you can't find out what just happened. You have to enable it first and then the user has to do something. So that's, that's kind of a negative. Whereas uh, ProGetStack is immediate. It's whatever is going on right, right now. So that's an advantage to ProGetStack, a disadvantage uh, to the client statement cache. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, there is an impact on client server connections for the client statement cache because all that data has to go back and forth to the database, whereas you don't have anything equivalent for that with ProGetStack. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, so pros and cons, uh, but what we really like about client statement cache is that as a DBA, you can enable it, you can use it just from the database server. You don't have to reach out and touch client machines to figure out what's going on. And it gives you insight into what's going on with the database, if not the entire application. Uh, as Adam mentioned, you don't need to change code in order to enable this. That's true. So <clears throat> if you have it enabled, there are a number of uh, uh, screens in ProTop that will automatically show you uh, the results of the client statement cache. So when you're looking at uh, things like the user I.O. activity, we automatically show you where that activity is coming from. Uh, the CSC age column tells you how old that sample is. So if you have a long running query, you're gonna see a, lo a longer age there, uh, or if the data is stale. Uh, but if the data is stale, you're not gonna have any activity, so it's not gonna make your top 10. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, if you look at the user detailed information, you can get the whole stack in there as well. It also shows up on the active transaction screens and in places like that. Anywhere where it makes sense for the client statement cache to be worked in, uh, we work that in. Uh, if you do enable it uh, globally, then you will get a warning on the way out. Uh, you can either turn it on globally or you can shut it off globally. And there are some caveats, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on really old versions of progress. It, you might want to be careful about it. Uh, but on your modern, newer versions of progress, it's generally safe to just turn it on uh, and run it for as long as you need it to run, particularly in a test environment uh, or a development environment, which is most of what we're talking about right now. <clears throat> All right, so the next topic that uh, is pretty interesting to developers is getting a handle on table and index activity. Uh, you know, your database activity is primarily tables and indexes. There are some lobs, uh, but uh, lob support from Progress uh, is really quite new. Uh, they didn't have any explicit support for the statistics for lobs until version 12. Uh, so we're not really going to talk about that too much. We will mention it, but not a lot. So the first thing you need to do is to set the stage. 
uh, the reporting of table and index statistics is not automatically enabled. By default, Progress only enables the first 50 tables and indexes in your database. Uh, most databases have way more than 50 tables and even more indexes than that. The sports database fits within 50 tables. The indexes don't all fit within 50, but the tables do. Uh, but real databases tend to have a lot more data than that. Uh, so Protop has a feature. Uh, the capital T screen in uppercase T will evaluate your schema and give you some suggestions for what those parameter settings should be. Uh, and we give you two options. We give you kind of the minimal application settings, which just covers your application tables. And we also give you suggested settings for getting everything, including the meta schema uh, tables, which are, as a developer, it's fascinating to see how much activity there actually is against the meta schema. So I usually run uh, with the complete settings uh, because then that tells you how much activity is going on there. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, like I mentioned, OpenEdge does not track lobs prior to OpenEdge 12. Uh, and prior to 12.2, uh, the lob data is misreported uh, as table data in some cases. So it'll show up, the lob number will show up under a particular table number that is the same as the lob. So you have to be careful that you're running at least 12.2 uh, if you have lobs and you want to track that data. Uh, in these, prior to, prior to OpenEdge 12, uh, you had to shut down the database and restart it to set these parameters. Uh, you can now uh, set this uh, with um, ProUtil uh, online. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Question. Yes. Okay. Question is the calculated table range is 1145. Yeah. And why yeah. Did you put it by uh, so. So the question is, why did I suggest 1,200? No, why did, why did we suggest the exact amount? Because next week we have another setting. OK, so you're. Why did you just round it up? <coughs> I did round it up. Um, OK, so, uh, so the question is about rounding up the table range. So the actual highest monitored table number is 1095. I'm suggesting that you set it 550 higher. Uh, so that you do have a little bit of a, a little bit of a pad, because people tend to add tables and indexes, and you don't want to have to change these parameters, you know, every couple of days. Um, so we, we usually recommend that people add a little bit of a pad, not a crazy amount, because this does use memory. Uh, so every every slot that you take for this is going to use up a little bit of memory, uh, and you don't want to get get totally nuts. Yeah, there's about 50 extra entries. Uh, So uh, what that does is that, that allows you to see specifically what the session table, session index, uh, or the global table and global index activity is within your, um, within your database. Uh, we track the creates, reads, updates, deletes. Uh, you can get the operating system reads if you're on a uh, relatively up-to-date progress. I think this was 10.1 C-ish they added the OS reads. Um, and likewise, you get similar data about the indexes. We also merge that data with information from DB analysis. So if you've run a DB analysis, we know things like what the average row size is, how many rows you have, uh, what the index utilization is, which is also very, very interesting as a programmer. If you're having issues with um, index utilization or, or fragmentation, uh, that's good for you to know. That can be affected by how you write your code, whether you're doing updates, um, incrementally or whether you're saving them up and doing a big update all at once that can impact fragmentation uh, and it might be good feedback for your DBAs as well when you design your production deployment databases how do you want to set your rows per block how do you want to set your create and toss limits you get that information from here uh, we find in general that running DB analysis unless you have a really big database multi terabytes is something that most people can do um, uh, at least weekly and probably daily. Uh, so, you, you know, it used to be you didn't want to run a DB analysis because it would take eight hours. Um, but on more modern systems, it's actually relatively fast these days. Uh, so you can do it nightly uh, without too much trouble. Of course, you know, caveat emptor, uh, make sure that uh, your system can actually handle that. Um, oh, and this uh, 
column here called churn. Uh, that's a really critical column from a developer's point of view. So one of the big problems that we run into in a lot of applications, um, almost every application, is that there are a few small tables, not necessarily more than two or three tables, and they don't necessarily have more than 10 or 20 records in them. They might have 100 records in them, but they're not really big table-wise. Uh, but the amount of I.O. that you do against those tables is extraordinary. Um, and you can see applications where the reads against these tiny little control tables are millions and millions of reads per second sometimes. Sometimes it's, well. <clears throat> um, and that drives latch contention uh, when you get out into your production environments where you have a, a large number of users uh, or maybe if you're a partner and you deploy to many customers, one of your customers suddenly becomes much more successful uh, and they, have, they take your application further than it's ever been and suddenly this bottleneck appears that you never noticed before. Uh, and that is called out when you see the churn value. This is basically the ratio of the number of reads to the size of the table. So if you have 100 records in the table and you read it 1,000 times during the sample, that'll give you a churn value of 10. And what that's telling you is that you have an opportunity there. You've got a chance to improve that by caching that data. Uh, you could move it to a temp table. Uh, you could do something with uh, object-oriented classes to build a cache class for that. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can, you can attack that, but that will be a bottleneck going, going forward. So you want to try, as a developer, to um, solve that problem before it comes, comes up and bites you. So we have a comment that it's often in the triggers or include files. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's frequently in code that is being reused over and over and over throughout the system. Um, one of the tricks uh, that we sometimes take with this, <coughs> particularly for people who have include files, um, a lot of times you'll find an application that has an include file that is part of every program. Um, and what you can do is you can define a temp table, uh, a global shared temp table, I'm expecting lightning to strike me down any moment now. Uh, you define a global shared temp table with the same name as the database table in this include file. And in your startup procedure, just copy the, um, the database table into the temp table, and then it's cached for the remainder of the session. Now, that only makes sense if um, the table doesn't change very often. But if it's, if it's a control table uh, and, uh, you know, you're your access truly is read-only, that will make all of the database I.O. go away. Um, and we've, we've had situations where we've removed half of somebody's database um, activity by doing that kind of thing. Uh, it's sort of miraculous in a way. It's also a really, really ugly kludge, but hey, it works. <coughs> so along with looking at all the tables uh, uh, the, or all the table activity across the system, or looking at table activity uh, for a particular user, sometimes you want to know which users are using a table. So this is kind of a third view. So you can enter um, through the eight or the nine command, you can ask for the top users of a particular table or a particular index. Uh, and you can enter the table name or you can actually use the table number if you know it. Um, and then you'll get these listings of who the, who the users of table customer are. Uh, it'll tell you that the table number is 214, it's in area 174, and that it has a quarter of a million records in it. And you'll get the users listed in the order of their activity. Uh, and you'll also see, well, if you have the client statement cache enabled, you'll see uh, what programs they're running, what line number of those programs is actually active. And this is really, really helpful too if you're trying to figure out what the source of activity is against a particular table that you don't expect to be uh, as busy as it is. Likewise with indexes. Okay, so another big problem that people have with applications is uh, their active transactions and their block sessions. So this is a kind of a classic uh, progress problem where people have issues with sessions that are blocking each other or transactions that are running for too long. 
So Protop has a couple of screens for that. We have one for block sessions, and we have another for active transactions. So if you have a block session, that's usually a record lock, uh, where some user has a record locked, some other user is trying to um, read that record with a lock, not a no-lock read, that won't re result in a block session. Uh, and Protop will detect that, and uh, if it does, uh, you'll get a listing that shows you uh, what is going on. So here in this example, we have somebody waiting on a record lock. We can see that the table that they're waiting for is WM pick. Uh, the resource ID is 19660774448. That's the rec ID. Uh, they're queued for an exclusive lock. Uh, and the user who is blocking them uh, is the next important part, and that's right here. It's user 217. Uh, they're a batch user, uh, and their process ID is 52762. Uh, we can also see that the blocking user, not the user who is blocked, but the one who is doing the blocking, is on line 422 of ghettoparn.p, whatever that is. So that helps you to find where the blocker is. Not, you know, you already know who the blockee is, so this tells you who the blocker is. Uh, and since you have both ends of the problem, you can zero in on the code that's involved and figure out who's at fault and figure out how to fix it. A lot of times, uh, the blocker will also have an active transaction. Uh, and Progress is famous for the acti long active transaction problem where you, you have a user, they start a transaction, they go to lunch, or they go on vacation, as the case may be. Uh, and uh, the transaction goes on and on and on, and the BI file grows and grows and grows. And before you know it, you've got uh, 200 gigabytes of BI uh, which can happen in a matter of moments these days because disk subsystems are way faster than they used to be. Um, so what you want there is you want to have a listing of who has active transactions and what they're doing, uh, how old those transactions are or the duration, uh, and how long you've been idle. So we're keeping track of not just how old the transaction is, but when was the last time you talked to the database? Uh, a user who has started a transaction and who is not talking to the database is very much one of those users that I was talking about who has got up and gone off for a cup of coffee or left for the day or whatever they have. You know that that user is not doing anything productive. A user uh, who in, and whose idle time um, or, or whose idle time is zero, on the other hand, is actually doing something productive. That's a user who may have a transaction that's poorly scoped but they're working. So you're more likely, if you call that user up at their desk, you're more likely to actually get them, for one thing, and you can ask them what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe they say, well, I'm in the uh, sales update process. Don't, please don't kill me. <laughs> um, so you, know, you have better decision-making capabilities there. Um, and this also, uh, again, shows you the client statement cache so you can figure out where in the code this is and help you back up to where the programming went wrong so that you had a transaction whose scope was too broad. Uh, and we have an entire talk on transaction scoping and developing, developer uh, approaches to that, so we won't really get into that right now. Uh, but Protop helps you to identify these things and find where in your code this problem is so that you can go and resolve it more readily than you would be if you're just knowing that, oh my goodness, I've got a long transaction but I don't really know what's happening or, or where it's coming from. Uh, you may look at that code and say, hey, this is great. I want to uh, start using the end of our lock VST and uh, put something in my code so that if a user gets a record lock, I can tell them what's going on or maybe I can log it. Be careful. Now, the underbar lock is a lot faster than it used to be, um, but that doesn't mean it's fast. Uh, you can write a lot of code in your development environment that does things like go out and look at the lock table and return which records are being locked and uh, who's holding those locks. And it'll run really, really well in development. It won't run well in production. Um, because in production, uh, people often have very large values for their lock table, like a million or two million or something like that. Uh, and even though the new lock table uh, capabilities are much faster than they used to be, they're still not fast. Uh, and it takes a long time to scan a large lock table. Uh, so uh, 
proceed with caution if you're going to go down that route. Don't, don't, don't assume that because it works well and you've heard it's faster that it's still okay to do that in production because it's, it's kind of dicey. Uh, Protop has some code uh, that detects whether or not that lock table is very large and which will not pursue um, the lock table if it's taking too long. Um, so, you know, we've, we've done some stuff there to try to prevent that from being a problem for you. You can look at our code. The source is shipped, um, and it's not that hard to follow. Well, I hope it's not that hard to follow. You can always contact me if it is. Okay, so another thing that, that uh, developers really need a little bit of insight into is how long did something really take? Now, one solution to that is to use e-time and message statements, but that's really pretty crude, uh, and there's a lot of downsides to that. Progress has a much better feature <coughs> called the Code pro pro Profiler. And if you've used uh, PDSOE, uh, you may be familiar with the Code Profiler, uh, but what you might not know is that you can embed the profiler into your application using the session, um, uh, using the session handle profiler. Uh, so as a developer, uh, you might want to do that. You might want to put a capability into your application and you can enable it like this, profiler colon enabled equals yes. You give it a, a description. Uh, you have to both enable it and turn on profiling. Uh, you give a file name for the output and your application does stuff, and you say, okay, disable, shut off profiling, and write the data. Um, <clears throat> we have some code that we ship that shows you how to do this. Uh, it's in uh, the libzprof uh, procedures. You can set it up for a little hotkey or something like that within your application. Uh, and there's an example of that in Protop. So one of the things I do with Protop is I'm very concerned that uh, performance is good. So profiling is enabled in Pro, or can be enabled in Protop through a hotkey, uh, and you can try it out for yourself. Uh, so it's the, uh, it's the capital Y key uh, in Protop. Uh, when you turn it on, uh, we will warn you uh, that you want to be careful because the profiler files can become really big in a hurry, uh, even faster than the BI file. <laughs> I used to, many years ago, many, many years ago, so many years ago that I almost questioned my sanity, uh, I had a, a, a customer where we had profiling enabled universally. So every session started up with a profiler. And that was great. And then at the end of the day, we'd take all those profiler output files and we would run them through a batch program which would go and look and see what the top uh, lines of code were for, for each uh, user that day and we'd see is, is something new popping up there. Well, that was great. It worked really well. It consumed an enormous amount of disk space. <laughs> and, then they, and then they started growing. Uh, so we kind of had to cut it back. Uh, and eventually we cut it back to where we just randomly sampled one in 10 users um, and didn't do them all. But it was kind of fun because you would, you would see whether or not there was additional uh, or new uh, users of or new usages of the application that were taking time that you didn't really expect. But do be careful because the profiler will generate very, very large uh, temporary files. Usually what you want to do is you want to turn on the profiler when you're coming into a piece of code that you know is troublesome uh, and then turn it off when you're done. Uh, to adequately profile, uh, you have to get a clean exit from whatever it is you're looking at. Uh, so if your session crashes, you're going to lose the profiler data. Uh, but the temp file will still be there, and it will still need to be cleaned up. Um, it's really easy to set it up to be headless as well. So you can, um, so Pro Protop will tell you, okay, I'm enabled and it'll run. Um, or you can have a batch program that just looks for uh, some sort of a flag file and says, okay, turn it on, turn it off. Uh, and then when, when, the when the Protop example is done, it runs uh, a report that gives you the top lines of code. It tells you uh, where, the, where the time's going. Uh, you could also embed this in like an app server uh, startup procedure. Uh, we did this at a customer a few months ago where they were having some issues with app server performance. So when their app server's connected, we would turn on profiling under certain circumstances 
gather the information for that session, dump it out, then run it through the processing side of things to see where the bottleneck was. That was very successful. Um, and it basically just runs this report. And the nice thing about this report is that it tells you uh, the thing that you most want to know, which is where was the total execution time? And this is, this is total execution time, not including things like sitting around waiting for the user to, to uh, respond to, it, to a prompt or waiting for external I.O. or anything like that. This is actual execution of code or database requests. Um, in fact, in this case, Protop itself uh, kind of surprised us the first time uh, that we saw this, which was when uh, uh, the change was made to uh, the act buffer VST uh, to track um, different types of blocks. All of a sudden, access to that VST became much slower than it used to be. And suddenly, we had a new, uh, new line, 4163, which was the slowest thing in Protop. That was, that was always fun. These are debug listing line numbers. So you do need to compile with the debug list option in order to, uh, to get them. Hmm, I'm running behind. Uh, caveats, most of those I already mentioned. Uh, one thing that's uh, particularly nasty is that if you have code that has multiple statements on one line, like do i equals one to 100, colon, i equals i plus one, colon, or period, end, uh, the profiler can't see that second and third line. So that code will hide. That's not really a whole lot of fun. Uh, and sometimes it can have a noticeable effect on your runtime. Uh, so be careful, you don't wanna turn on profiling in production if you're kinda right on the edge of things and performance is an issue. Uh, on the other hand, that's sort of a catch-22. If performance is an issue, you need to know why, so. <laughs> okay, temp tables. Um, temp tables are another thing where uh, you can't reach into some other session to get information, but you can instrument the, in, the uh, uh, session with some code that can give you information about what's happening with temp tables. Uh, Progress created a temp table VST kind of a thing along with a helper object to uh, help you do that and there's some sample code in Protop that will show you how you can embed that in your application. And then you can get data like this. You find out how big your temp tables are, how many temp tables you have, how many reads and writes you've been doing to those temp tables, not just globally, uh, but the individual temp tables themselves. <clears throat> and you get all the uh, number of records, creates, reads, updates, deletes, all that fun stuff. You do that, uh, by using this uh, uh, progress.database.tempTableInfo class. And code that looks sort of like that. Uh, you have to be careful because it's only in 11 plus. Anybody running anything older than version 11? Ooh, okay, well, can't use this. <laughs> so, uh, and here's some uh, kind of the TT info is the program you want to look at to figure out how to do it. Uh, but it's real handy as a developer to be able to pull that information out and say, okay, this is what I'm doing with temp tables within my code. <clears throat> and user table stats. Um, this is another thing that's uh, fun to embed within your own code. This basically is, tell me about what my session is doing. Um, I'm gonna go really fast because I'm over time. Um, but basically, you can embed some sample code to get the user table stats and then report that back into your session. Uh, and you might see something like this. That's what I did. Um, Mike has embedded this in his Smart Component Library uh, toolkit. So if you're running the Smart Component Library, you get an example of, of that in your development environment or in your app servers. The data is being put out there. It's all very handy in helping you figure out what you're doing, what your code is doing that is different than anything else. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, there's a few more things that we don't have time for. Uh, we have uh, some reports on server info, uh, which help you to see what your, what your client server traffic is between the database and the clients. Uh, this is particularly compelling as more and more people are having to move away from shared memory and understand what the data flow is back and forth there. <clears throat> 
uh, reports within uh, progress or within ProTop to help you to see your parameter configuration and whether or not uh, you have all your parameters set correctly. Uh, ProTop contains a feature called AppMon that lets you add application specific monitoring. So your own application can have uh, KPIs that you might want ProTop to monitor and trend. And we have a hook, basically a developer hook for you to, to use that. Uh, when you're using ProTop, uh, the pause key helps you to freeze the screen so you can take a screenshot if you want. Uh, or you can just use the at key and send an email uh, to yourself with all that data in it. So that's, that's kind of handy. Uh, sequence viewer and some SQL features. So with that, do we have anything in the chat or any questions in the room? Mr. Chat Monitor. Nothing in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Okay. Anything in the room? All right. Well, thank you very much. I uh, used up a little more of your time than I was supposed to, so um, we'll... Uh, See, no, I thought I was at 45. This says I'm at 47. <laughs> all, that, all that hurrying for nothing? Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, hmm, I think, okay, well, we're done, so. <laughs>